All right, guys, it's turning out to be a lovely Monday morning here in the collapse of global industrial civilization after the storm of the century blowing through <coughs> crazy crane campground. It is sunshine is coming out here in uh, the Point Lonesome Swamp on this love now lovely Monday morning, April 12th, as I start my last week <coughs> in the Sunshine State before heading back to New York one week from today. And uh, so after today, I'm going to be up camping and whatnot <coughs> deep in the Okefenokee Swamp, I am thrilled to say, for the balance of the week. So it will probably be Saturday before I bring you the next chronicle of the collapse. But uh, anyway, it's no problem uh, for today's chronicle because the mainstream media news is full of all sorts of doom and gloom today. <coughs> and uh, I guess we're going to start over here right on good old Associated Press. Uh, I need to be real careful here. Discarded masks litter beaches worldwide, threatening sea life. Uh, imagine that. Discarded masks littering beaches and the, the ocean uh, worldwide, threatening sea life. But I understand that nobody listening to uh, me on this channel wants to hear one word. Uh, about how the corona panic uh, is anything but good for the planet. Yes, and uh, how, of course, protecting humans uh, from the corona panic trumps uh, any other objective on the planet. Keeping humans from getting sick. Uh, but anyway, we're going to leave that. Maybe I will send this off to some other doomer and uh, who understands that the corona panic is not good for the planet and let him cover it. But, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, I am uh, really getting impressed with CBS News' recent environmental reporting. Uh, now, CBS News becomes the new voice of the Doomosphere. So I went over there to CBS, CBS and uh, came up with several. I'm just going to touch on this one. Western U.S. may be, may be entering the worst drought in modern history. I'm sure the other Doomers are talking about this. And so before I join the echo chamber, I'm just going to uh, read the opening three paragraphs and turn it over, I don't know, I guess Paul Beckwith and Kevin over at Black Bear News and maybe Sandy and Jennifer at Environmental Coffee House can uh, pick up, uh, for those of you not aware of this, <clears throat> extreme drought across the western U.S has become as reliable as a summer afternoon thunderstorm in Florida. Jesus, talk about summer afternoon thunderstorms in Florida. And news headlines about drought in the West can seem a bit like a broken record, with some scientists saying the region is on the precipice of a permanent drought. That is because in the year 2000, the western U.S. entered the beginning of what scientists call a mega drought, the second worst in 1,200 years, triggered by a combination of a natural dry cycle and human-caused climate change. In the past 20 years, the two worst stretches of drought came in 2003 and 2013, but what is happening 
right now appears to be the beginning stages of something even more severe. And as we head into the summer dry season, the stage is set for an escalation of extreme dry conditions with widespread water restrictions expected and yet another dangerous fire season ahead. I assure you uh, we will be uh, hearing a lot more about the mega drought uh, <clears throat> in the U.S. West as the summer of 2021 unfolds. But uh, since so many people are probably already covering that one, also here on CBS News, the one I'm going to zero in on because it's such a perfect microcosm. I, I, I like the, you know, the mega drought macrocosm stories are good, but I like to zero in on these little microcosm stories. Uh, you know, the, the drops of water dripping off. Do they drip off of stalactites or stalagmites? But you know what I'm talking. The drip, drip, drip of uh, environmental collapse. So while, you know, about an hour from where I'm sitting, we're dealing with this in unfolding environmental disaster from this uh, phosphate pit uh, right here in central Florida. CBS News is taking us right off of the coast of Los Angeles, California, where this uh, shocking environmental disaster has been unfolding for 70 years. For 70 years, 10 miles off the coast of Los Angeles, we have had this unfolding environmental disaster that I had never heard of uh, until this morning. And you, you can take this story, guys, and you can multiply this. Y you know, how many thousands, how many millions of times over the planet. And, you know, this is why I'm always saying, you know, trying to isolate uh, the different reasons for, you know, cancer rates or whatever. Uh, it, it is this toxic stew uh, that, there, that there is no way to go in there and parcel out. Like, we're going to fix this phosphate uh, leak over here in Florida and all our troubles are going to be solved. But anyway, uh, what is going on today? 10 miles from downtown Los Angeles, California. <clears throat> Just 10 miles off the coast of Los Angeles lurks an environmental disaster over 70 years in the making, which few have ever heard about. That is, until now, thanks to the research of a University of California marine scientist named David Valentine, working with little more than rumors and a hunch. Curiosity guided him 3,000 feet below the ocean's surface, a few hours of research time, and an autonomous robotic submersible unearthed what has been hidden since the 1940s. Countless barrels of toxic waste laced with DDT littering the ocean floor between Long Beach and Catalina Island. The fact that his underwater camera spotted dozens of decaying barrels immediately in what is otherwise a barren desert-like seafloor, Valentine says, is evidence that the number of barrels is likely immense, although the exact number is still unknown. A historical account estimates it may be as many as half a million, half a million leaking barrels of DDT 
10 miles and you, and you wonder why the ocean floor in that area is a desert wasteland. <clears throat> After 70 plus years of inaction, Valentine's research has finally helped initiate a huge research effort to reveal the extent of the contamination, but this offshore dump site is only a part of the story of environmental damage from years of DDT discharge along the coast of Southern California, a story which likely will not be closed for decades to come because of its own because of its ongoing impact, including a recently discovered alarming and unprecedented rate of cancer in the state's sea lion population with one in every four adult sea lions now plagued with cancer. Yes. Uh, so, for those of you who don't remember uh, Silent Spring. Here is a brief history of DDT dumping. The chemical DDT was invented in 1939 and used during World War II as a pesticide helping to protect troops from insect-borne diseases like malaria. After the war, production of the chemical ramped up and it became routinely used in the spraying of crops and even over crowded beaches to eliminate pests like mosquitoes. I remember as a child growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, how the DDT trucks would come down my street uh, every week or so, sp just spraying DDT all over my neighborhood. But in the 1960s, DDT was discovered to be toxic. Over time, <coughs> eating food laced with DDT builds up inside the tissues of animals and humans, resulting in harmful uh, side effects. The EPA now calls DDT a, quote, probable human carcinogen. In 1972, when the U.S. government started taking environmental pollution seriously, uh, blah, 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 DDT was banned in 1972 in the United States. Uh, but I don't know if this story gets to this fact, although it was banned for use, as far as I know, they might still be manufacturing DDT in the US. The manufacture of DDT was not banned and we kept selling this to all of these third world countries and my guess is that there's a, a bunch of countries still use DDT and then sell the DDT laced produce back to American consumers. I know this was the case in the past few years, and I'm going to take and I take a wild guess that that little inconvenient loophole has not been closed. Maybe this article will get around to this. Um, the largest DDT manufacturer in the U.S., Montrose Chemical Corporation, was located along the Southern California coast in the city of Torrance. From 1947 through 1982, Montrose manufactured and distributed DDT worldwide. In doing so, a byproduct mix of toxic sludge made of petrochemicals, DDT, and PCBs was produced. For decades, that hazardous waste was disposed of in two ways. Some of the toxic pollution was dumped directly into storm drains in the sewer system, which was then pumped out to sea through outflow pipes two miles offshore of the city Rancho Palos Verdes. The rest of the waste was disposed of in barrels, which were loaded onto 
barges and floated 10 to 15 miles offshore to waste dumping sites off Catalina Island and jettisoned into the ocean. Yes, while it may seem hard to believe, at least part of that dumping was legally permitted. Back then, Valentine says, the prevailing thought was the oceans were so huge they could never be compromised. The mantra was, dilution is the solution to pollution. In hindsight, a naive notion. But while the designated dumping site was very deep in 3,000 feet of water, Valentine says shortcuts were taken and barrels being dumped much closer to shore. And in an effort to get the barrels to sink, there is evidence that many were slashed, allowing the poison to leak as they were dropped into the ocean. For decades, the existence of these toxic barrels was surmised only by a very small group of scientists and regulators. That is despite a startling report produced in the 1980s which asserted that there may be as many as 500,000 barrels laced with DDT sitting on the ocean floor. That report was largely ignored, but after nearly 30 years, Valentine dusted it off as he began his quest to see if these barrels really existed. Um, unlike the deep water dumping sites, the shallower toxic site just two miles off the beaches of Rancho Palos Verdes was well known and documented. In 1996, this zone was declared a super fun cleanup site by the EPA, now comprising a 34 square mile area. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it, 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 anyway, guys, uh, I see this is uh, good for CBS News. What I am going to do uh, is, is post this. You know, they always put up uh, at the beginning of the stories, uh, they put how long it takes to read the story. They said this is a 10 minute story. I, I'm actually working hard to talk fast. Uh, but I see at my rate of reading with my, you know, with my comments, uh, it would probably take me 45 minutes to read this. So if you want to take it from here, uh, please go on the link, the, the, the link and read it yourself. Um, let's just scroll down to the bottom, uh, <clears throat> to the bottom paragraph of this long, excellent story from good old CBS News. While there are still many unanswered questions, one lesson from this story of DD contamination is clear. When humans, when humans callously pollute the environment, it can have consequences for generations to come. One current example of that is human-caused climate change. The question is, how much of a burden will our children and grandchildren have to bear as a result of our choices? Yes, how much of a burden will our children and grandchildren have to bear? Well, uh, I guess scrounging for food on a radi irradiated hellscape uh, might be one way, but that's a rant for another day. But anyway, it has turned into an absolutely glorious day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization, and I have to head to the laundromat and uh, dry out the soggy 
sheets and towels and stuff uh, before heading off to the Okefenokee Swamp for the rest of the week. So uh, I will check in with you guys probably on Saturday with my ecological meltdown roundup rant. I highly advise getting out there and enjoying the Okefenokee Swamp while you still can before 500,000 barrels of radioactive whatever are found at the bottom of the Okefenokee Swamp. Good Lord. Bye, guys.